Let me introduce you Marco Santabrocio and Andrea Raimondi, and the title of the talk is <laughs> A Bifurcation uh, Meaning of All Science that we retrieve in case. Yes, Marco and Raimondi. Um, I'll say a few words first, and then I'll let my friend Andrea to go on with the paper proper. Um, let me only say that it is a great honor, as well as a great pleasure, to be invited to this annual international conference at the Ural Federal University. Together with my friend Andrea, we embrace the humanist ideals upheld by the organizing committee, compassion, solidarity, and justice. They're always important, but more important in these difficult times when war and conflict are rife all over the world. The scientific community must stand united and make its voice heard. We value the painstaking practice of giving arguments and criticizing what we think is not right, without bullying our opponents, giving everyone the right to criticize us in turn. It is our duty to practice such principles and to set an example. Let us hope we can measure up to such ideal. Now, I let it to my friend Andrea to continue the paper. Thank you. Uh, hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah? yeah, great. Okay, so we start, you can see uh, the handout, uh, probably you also have a printed version of it. We will use it uh, quite a lot today because there are some uh, uh, quotations, uh, citations we need to look at and then uh, a bit of uh, um, the formal part of the paper, so it's quite useful if you have it with you or if you look at it on the screen. Um, okay, so uh, thanks for inviting us. I, uh, of course, share Marco's words. Um, so we start without further ado uh, on the paper. Um, okay, so such distinguished logicians and philosophers as Alonzo Church and Michael Dammett uh, heavily criticized Gottlob Frege's rendering of identity as the allegedly metalinguistic relation of identity of content in paragraph 8 of uh, Frege's Begeschrift. In this paper, we present a new interpretation of that paragraph, which substantially differs from the usual one, namely the interpretation assumed by Church and Dammet, among many others. Our interpretation takes uh, very seriously uh, Frege's idea that a bifurcation in the meaning of all science is needed to account for such predicates as identity of content. Uh, bifurcation in the meaning of all science is an expression you will find in uh, uh, Frege's passage we will read in a while. Now, we will implement this notion of a bifurcation of meaning by assigning semantic values that are a bit more complex than the usual ones, to all well-formed expressions of a language, the syntax of which is standardly first order. In particular, the semantic value of an expression will be an ordered pair containing the ordinary referent of the expression and the expression itself. This is the fundamental idea. And this semantic framework will allow us to show how Frege could effectively answer Church's and Dammet's criticisms. Now, we would like to stress uh, before starting uh, that the aim of this paper is not merely or even primarily exegetical. So even though we believe uh, that our interpretation is faithful to what Frege had in mind, we only claim that it offers what Frege could or should have said. The focus is on the novelties that a bifurcated semantics, or as we would call it, two-component semantics, can offer. Besides answering Churches and Dammets of criticisms and showing identity of content as newly interpreted to be tantamount 
to standard identity, this semantics allows representing quotation marks as a genuine function symbol belonging to the object language. It is well known that this result is uh, virtually impossible within standard semantics. This fact that this has given rise to several theories to circumvent such impossibility. And as a byproduct of this result, uh, treating quotation marks as a function symbol, two component semantics provides a new treatment of the so-called uh, Giorgione sentences, which have puzzled uh, such eminent philosophers as Willard Van Oman Quine. Time permitting, we will also argue that our approach provides the tools to tackle a puzzle concerning anaphora. But let's see if we will have time. So let us start by reading the passage from the good shift that will torment us for a while. And you have it on the handout. Craig says, identity of content differs from conditionality and negation in that it applies to names, not to contents. Whereas in other contexts, signs are merely representatives of their content, so that every combination into which they enter express only a relation between their respective contents, they suddenly display their own selves when they are combined by means of the sign for identity of content. For it expresses the circumstance that two names have the same content. Hence, the introduction of a sign for identity of content necessarily produces a bifurcation in the meaning of all signs. They stand at times for their content, at times for themselves. Now let A is identical in content to B mean that the sign A and the sign B have the same conceptual content so that we can everywhere put B for A and conversely. Now, the standard interpretation of this passage is uh, neatly summarized by Church as follows. Church says, we mentioned the doctrine of Frege's Begushit of 1879, according to which the relation of identity or equality is a relation between names rather than the things named, apparently on the ground that identity construed in the latter sense would be too trivial a relation to serve its intended purpose. Now, we believe that the following uh, four main claims lie at the core of this interpretation, which is implicitly assumed in most discussion of Frege's passage, and you can see the references in the handout in a footnote. So these are the four main claims we think are part of the standard interpretation. First, the German Inhalt, translated into English as content here, means the same as ordinary referent, where an ordinary referent of a singular term typically is a mundane object, such as a planet, a person, etc. Same for conceptual content. Second point, stand for and display mean the same as refer to. And meaning means the same as reference. Third point, the whole passage expresses the view that the signs flanking the sign for identity of content refer to themselves. The sign for identity of content refers to the relation that holds true between two signs if and only if they have the same ordinary referent. This is precisely what Tarski, what sorry, Church uh, says in the above passage. Finally, fourth claim, a sign on each of its occurrences refers either to its ordinary referent or to itself, but not to both. Now, Frigge's passage, as standardly understood, has met with almost universal disapproval. In particular, Church and Dammet charge Frege's treatment of identity of content as being on the verge of absurdity. And here are two illuminating passages from Church and Dammet. So first, Church writes, if use and mention are not to be confused, the idea of identity as a relation between names or signs renders a formal treatment of the logic of identity all but impossible. Now, let us expand this remark a bit. In the good shift, the logic of identity, as Church calls it, consists of the axioms 52 and 53. To illustrate the point, however, it is enough to consider the former axiom, which we can render in a contemporary notation as, if A is identical in content to B, then phi of A only if phi of B. And you have this formula on the right-hand side of the handout. 
This is Leibniz's law. Now, this axiom requires for its intelligibility that A and B have the same referent in the consequent as they have in the antecedent, of course. But it will not be so if Frege's remarks are interpreted according to the standard interpretation. This is because in the antecedent, they will refer to the signs A and B, whilst in the consequent, they will refer to their respective ordinary reference. That's Church, Church's objection, Church's worry. Dammit raises a different, though related worry. He writes, in the great shift, Frege held that identity was a relation between names and not between things. But this view makes no sense of the use of bound variables on either side of the sign of identity. The problem is, how are we to understand Frege's claim above that signs stand at times for the content at times for themselves as applied to the case in which the signs in question are bound variables? For instance, how is a formula like the one you see on the handout, there is an X such that X is identical to cont in content to A, supposed to be understood? In particular, what is the variable supposed to range over? This is Dunmet's worry. Now, these devastating, if appropriate, charges against Frege were not made lightly, we believe. But the point is, are they appropriate charges against Frege? We argue that Frege's passage above can be interpreted in such a way that makes it immune to Church's and Dunmet's objections. That's our main point. And we jump directly to our proposal. We want to take very seriously Frege's idea of a bifurcation in the meaning of all signs. And we do this by assigning to every sign an ordered pair, the first member of which is stipulated to be the ordinary referent, which Frege calls content, and the second member of which is the sign displaying its own self. And this is Frege's terminology. We call the ordered pair assigned to a sign its semantic value, and crucially, we let it be inherited by all its occurrences, thus achieving complete uniformity. So the semantic value of every occurrence of the sign is an ordered pair consisting of the ordinary referent of the sign, say, a planet, and the sign itself, the name of the planet. In other words, the semantic value of a sign as well as all its occurrences, is an ordered pair of the following form. Ordinary referent, sign. Even though both components occur in the semantic value of every occurrence, either one or the other can remain idle, as will become clear in a moment. For instance, intuitively, when the predicate is a planet, takes the name Hesperus as its argument, the truth value of the resulting sentence does not depend on the second component of the semantic value of the name. Hesperus is a planet is true just in case a certain object, not a certain name, belong to the set of the planets. Some remarks are now in order before giving the formal semantics. First, two component semantic values are our counterpart to Frege's bifurcated meanings. Uh, recall his words, the introduction of a sign for identity of content necessarily produces a bifurcation in the meaning of all signs. Incidentally, it is far from clear why one would speak of meaning as bifurcating, as Frege does, if it merely alternated between two distinct entities as the standard interpretation holds. Second point, recall that the standard interpretation conflates the relations of standing for, displaying, and meaning invoked in Frege's passage, taking all of them to amount to the relation of referring to. We take the relation of standing for to encompass both referring to and displaying. And crucially, we keep these two relations distinct so that bifurcating semantic values does not amount to assigning two reference to every sign. This is quite crucial. The first component of a sign semantic value is the sign's ordinary referent. For example, in the case of Hesperus, a certain planet. But its second component, the sign or name itself, is merely displayed, is not referred to. The import of the distinction between referring to and displaying will become apparent as soon as we give substance to the claim that for each occurrence of a given sign, 
it can be the case that either component of its semantic value remains idle or semantically irrelevant. We will illustrate this in a moment. Third, even though Frege infelicitously wrote that signs stand at times for their content and times for themselves, we deem that what he really had in mind was something along the following lines. Every occurrence of a sign simultaneously both refers to its ordinary referent and displays itself. But at times, only the ordinary referent is semantically relevant. At times, only the displayed expression is. Again, as we will explain in a moment. And now to our final comment before uh, seeing the formal semantics. It is to be noted that the sort of two component semantics that we attribute to Frege's Begriff shift is virtually identical to Frege's semantic proposal in Übersehen und Bedeutung. Except, of course, that in 1892, he substituted Sinne for expressions as the second components of the semantic values. However, the bifurcation is there, and so is the fact that sometimes it is the first component of the semantic value, and sometimes the second, that is relevant to the computation of truth values. Moreover, during the 13 years between the Begrifschrift and Übersehen und Bedeutung, Never did Frege consider objections such as those raised by Church and Dammit to the bigger shift's treatment of identity. And according to us, this at least suggests that their interpretation and the objections motivated by it might be misguided. So this should speak uh, somehow in favor of our interpretation. Um, setting exegetical issues aside, however, in what follows, we develop in detail the two component semantics sketched above, and give an entirely new interpretation of the relation between identity of content and standard identity, namely the notion of identity we all have in mind nowadays. We also diffuse Church's objection, and Dammit's objection can only be discussed after we develop our proposal to deal with quantification, and this will be the last point of the paper. So now we outline a non-standard semantics for a language, the syntax of which is standardly first order, with identity, individual constants, and function symbols. We call this language L, and you can see it on the handout. Intuitively, L is characterized by the fact that the second components of its expression semantic values are idle. Later, we will extend L to a richer language called L+, by adding some function and predicate symbols for which the second components of the semantic values of their arguments are not idle. We adopt the following convention, and since here our topic is the relation between language and metalanguage, this convention is very important to, keep, to be kept in mind. In the metalanguage, in our case English, bold phase syntactic constant expressions refer to the corresponding constants in the object language L. For instance, uh, Hesperus in bold and Phosphorus in bold are two individual constants of L and is a planet in bold is a unary predicate of L. Similarly, both face syntactic variables range over the property expressions in L. In particular, E in bold ranges over expressions of L. Uh, we add unofficial parentheses whenever it is useful for the sake of readability, but they should be no problem for us. To begin with, uh, consider the semantics for the fragment of L consisting of atomic sentences. Because of the bifurcation of semantic values, this semantics is a little more complicated than the ordinary one. So in order to keep things as simple as possible, we omit tedious details whenever they are relatively obvious. The structures A interpreting L consist of one, a universe U of individuals, a subset of which comprises all and only well-formed expressions of L. Individuals, including expressions, as well as operations, properties, and relations on U, are referred to by appropriate expressions in the meta-language written in capital letters. However, following the convention above, both the syntactic constants and variables of the meta-language range over only over the subset of U of well-formed expressions of L. Second point, well, second characteristic of our structures. We have a mapping uh, indicated by the square brackets 
which assigns to every primitive expression E in bold, an ordered pair consisting of E in capital letters, the ordinary referent of E, and E in bold, namely the expression E itself. This ordered pair is the semantic value of E in bold. The mapping is such that if F in bold is an anary function symbol, F in capital letters is an anary operation on the universe. In particular, if A in bold is a constant, capital A is an individual in, double, in U. The mapping assigns to every anary predicate symbol P in bold, an ordered pair P, capital letter, and P bold, such that P, capital letter, is an anary relation on the universe U. As to the inductive clause in the definition of the mapping, if F in bold is a unary function symbol and T in bold is a term, then we have that the semantic value of F T in bold is given by the usual composition of the semantic value of F in bold and the semantic value of T in bold. In particular, we will have an ordered pair for F, FF, an ordered pair for T, TT, and then they are combined in an interesting way. So F capital letter is combined with T, uh, and F bold is combined with T bold with concatenation. So you see that the parentheses here, not in boldface, stand for functional application, so the usual application we are all accustomed with, and the little symbol uh, stands for concatenation. Similarly for non-unary function symbols. So you see that the final, uh, the semantic value of FT in bold is an ordered pair obtained compositionally and with concatenation consisting of the application of F to T, capital letters, so a function to an object, and on the right hand side, the expression itself, FT. Note that if F star F bold is a unary function symbol, then the semantic value of F bold is a function from ordered pairs to ordered pairs. This function is not to be confused with the function F capital letter, which is uh, the ordinary referent of F in bold. As regards atomic sentences, if P in bold is a unary predicate symbol and T in bold is a, u is a term, then we have that the semantic value of the atomic sentence PT is given by the functional application of the semantic value of P bold to the semantic value of T in bold which means that on the left-hand side, we will end up with the truth value, which is the output of the application of uh, P in capital letter to T in capital letter, and on the right-hand side, again, the sentence itself, PT. Uh, okay. And of course, we'll have true if and only if uh, uh, T in capital letter belongs to P in capital letter, as usual. Um, it should be clear that there is no interaction between the two components of semantic values so far. In particular, the second components are only used to form the expressions via concatenation in whose semantic values they occur. That's it. Now, let us illustrate the definitions above with simple examples. Consider the individual constant Hesperus in bold. The unary predicate symbol is a planet in bold and the resulting atomic sentence is a planet Hesperus in bold. Suppose that our mapping uh, assigns the following semantic values to Hesperus in bold and is a planet in bold. So we have the semantic value of Hesperus is bold, which is a ordered pair containing the planet Hesperus or Venus and the name Hesperus itself. The semantic value of the predicate is a planet is uh, an ordered pair containing uh, um, basically a subset of U, of U, which contains all and only planets, and on the right hand side, the predicate itself. And then we have this computation of the semantic value of the sentence 
is a planet Hesperus in bold. Um, everything should be as straightforward as it looks here. So we have the semantic value of the predicate, the semantic value of the name. Uh, the first components interact compositionally in the usual way. Their right and their second components interact non-compositionally, but rather via concatenation. Thus, yielding the sentence is a planet Hesperus, whereas the first components yields the truth value true because Hesperus happens to be a member of the subset of U that contains all and only planets. Um, so you see that what's happening on the on the left hand side in the first components of the semantic values is what happens in more traditional semantic frameworks. Nothing new is going on. Now, an obvious example of a binary predicate symbol of L is the symbol for standard identity, which we indicate with the usual symbol for identity. An identity sentence is true if and only if the ordinary reference of the terms flanking the symbol are the same. So, for example, the semantic value of the sentence Hesperus is identical to Phosphorus will be an ordered pair containing the truth value true, because the two ordinary reference of Hesperus and Phosphorus are the same, and the sentence itself. Hesperus is identical to Phosphorus in both. Of course, standard identity satisfies Leibniz's law. But is it the same as what Frege calls identity of content in the Gleeschrift? This is a crucial question, of course, and we will answer this question in section five later. Uh, before proceeding, let me stress one important point. Nothing so far diverges from the standard semantics for a fragment of first order language apart from adjoining a second component as an idle burden to the standard semantic value, as easily seen by the fact that if we erased the second component from all semantic values, everything would be just as usual. So to repeat, what's happening with the first components of the semantic values is what we are already familiar with. What's happening on the second components of the semantic values is just a boring concatenation. So nothing new so far, except for this idle burden on the right-hand side, as it were. Now things will get a bit more complicated and we will see how relevant the second components can be in an enriched language, which we call L+. So we now enrich the language L by adding new function and predicate symbols that can be informally characterized as follows. Unlike the function and predicate symbols of L, when applied to some argument, they look at the second component of its semantic value to yield an ordinary referent. Paramount among them are quotation marks. Now, quotation marks do not figure in the language of the bigger shift, but our semantic framework gives us the means of expressing them as a genuine function symbol. Let the rich language be L plus, as I said, and let the universe's U of the structures interpreting L plus comprise all performed expressions of L plus besides those of L simply because L plus is an enrichment of L. Before presenting the details of our proposal, we briefly consider why no theory based on a standard semantic framework can express quotation marks as a function symbol. Um, to make this point, we chose a nice passage from Kaplan's uh, uh, review of uh, a paper published in 1965 on quotation, a paper published by this Newton Gave, the paper is called Varieties of Use and Mention. And in this review, Kaplan says uh, something very interesting about this point. He says, there is something of a functional nature about quotation marks, as is immediately clear from the fact that we understand quotation names that we have never seen before. This functional nature is presumably a consequence of the fact that all quotation names are understood by means of the single semantical rule. The result of enclosing an expression A in quotation marks is a standard name of A. But the failure to point out the significant differences between such a rule and the rule for a true functional expression seems to the reviewer, Kaplan, an omission as serious as the failure to point out 
the differences between quotation names and the Arabic numeral names for the first 10 numbers. Now, Kaplan is making two points here. First, there is something intuitively functional in the way quotation marks interact with what they enclose, as Kaplan's formulation of the rule makes abundantly clear. Nevertheless, and this is the second point, quotation marks cannot be a true function symbol that is within a traditional semantics, which Kaplan is obviously assuming here. Here is a simple reductio to show this point. Assume that the names Hesperus and Phosphorus have the same semantic value as in many traditional semantic frameworks. If the quotation marks were a true function symbol, the corresponding function would operate on the semantic values of the expressions they are applied to. Thus, applying them to the two names should result in the same output. But clearly, this is not the case. The quotation of Hesperus is not the same as the quotation of Phosphorus. The quotation of Hesperus refers to the name Hesperus. The quotation of Phosphorus refers to the name Phosphorus, a different name. In other words, echoing Russell's phrase, there is no backward road from, in this case, planets to names of planets. There is no function. Now, things are different in two-component semantics for the obvious reason that in these semantics, the names Hesperus and Phosphorus do not have the same semantic value. Their semantic values differ as regards their second components, the expressions themselves. This fact allows us to render the functional nature of quotations by means of a true function or a genuine function. To represent quotation marks in L+, plus, the enrichment of L, instead of using a pair of inverted commas, it is graphically preferable to have a simple function symbol, which we refer to by means of quote in bold. So we will not have quotation marks, but this function symbol, quote in bold. For the time being, let quote in bold apply only to well-formed expressions of L+. Plus. So if E in bold is a well-formed expression of L+, plus, uh, or of L, for that matter, quote E in bold is a term of L+. Plus. As you can see in the handout, here we add unofficial parentheses to make it clear that quote in bold is a function symbol applying to its argument e in bold. Thus, unlike more familiar function symbols, quote in bold applies to expressions of any syntactic category. E in bold could be a constant, a predicate symbol, a function symbol, and so on and so forth. This is as should be. Quote in bold is supposed to be the formal counterpart of the quotation marks of natural languages, which can be put around expressions of any syntactic category. Just like you can use any expression you like, you can mention any expression you like, and that's why we use quotation marks. Now, we define the semantic value of quote in bold in such a way that E in bold is the ordinary referent of quote E in bold, as intuitively desired. The referent of a quotation is the expression appearing between quotation marks. To this end, let the ordinary referent of quote in bold be a projection function that takes the whole of E as a semantic value, not just its ordinary referent, as input and outputs the second component. In other words, the ordinary referent of our function symbol quote in bold moves the second component of any semantic value it takes as input to the first position. Since the second component of its argument is not idle, Quote in bold is not in L, but rather in L+. Plus. So we have that the semantic value of quote in bold is an ordered pair, as usual, containing our projection function, quote in capital letters, and the, function, the, sorry, the symbol itself, quote in bold. For every expression E in bold, we define quote E in bold, namely the semantic value of quote E in bold, as the result of applying the semantic value of quote in bold to the semantic value of E in bold. And here you can see the computation of the semantic value, which should be relatively obvious, except for the third step, which is quite crucial. Here you have quote in capital letters, which is a our projection function, which takes as argument the whole of the semantic value of E, namely the ordered pair E capital letters and E bold, and outputs 
in both, as you can see in the final line. So the ultimate semantic value of uh, quote in bold is the ordered pair containing in bold, the expression itself, and quote in bold, of course. Thus, e in bold is the ordinary referent of quote in bold, as desired, as, as any other function symbol, quote in bold can be iterated an indefinite number of times. We illustrate this with an example. Consider the three expressions of L plus Hesperus in bold, quote Hesperus in bold, and quote quote Hesperus in bold. Uh, the, the last one should correspond to a double pair of quotation marks in natural language. Their respective semantic values are the ordered pair containing the planet Hesperus and the name Hesperus, then the ordered pair containing the name Hesperus and the quotation of the name Hesperus, quote Hesperus, and then the, the third one is the, 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 the ordered pair containing that quotation, quote Hesperus, and the quotation of the quotation of the name, quote, quote, Hesperus in bold. The transition from the first to the second is precisely what is affected by the function from ordered pairs to ordered pairs, that is the semantic value of quote in bold. It accepts the former pair, moves its second component to the first position, and concatenates quote in bold to the original expression, thus obtaining quote Hesperus in bold. The third pair is obtained by applying the function to the second. And you could go on and on like this, uh, iterating the quotation marks or our quote symbol. Now, besides function symbols, we also have predicate symbols that are in L plus, but not in L. The truth values of the sentences in which these predicate symbols occur depend not just on the ordinary reference of their arguments, but also on the expressions displayed. Paramount among them is the predicate symbol for what we call strict identity, uh, which we symbolize as these hash marks. For any two terms of L plus, A bold and B bold, A hash marks B in bold is true if and only if the semantic value of A and the semantic value of B are the same not just the ordinary reference, this is not standard identity, it's a strict identity. So it requires that the whole semantic values are identical. This means that only Hesperus, hash marks Hesperus is true, whereas Hesperus, hash marks Phosphorus is not true because Hesperus and Phosphorus have different semantic values. Now it goes without saying that for hash mark, unlike standard identity, Leibniz law holds unrestrictedly in L plus. Also, it should be quite obvious that the introduction of a hash mark, strict identity, affords a neat solution to the problem of informativeness. Uh, Hesperus is phosphorus is informative, Hesperus is Hesperus is not, which was all important for Frege. We are not going to discuss this point now, but it should be quite obvious that by introducing this special predicate symbol in L+, plus, we can account for the difference in informativeness between the two statements. And it is noteworthy that this solution is virtually identical to the solution envisaged by Frege himself in Übersinn und Bedeutung, except, of course, that the latter essay posits senses where the Begriff shift only as expressions on our interpretation, but the solution is virtually identical. Now, setting this point aside, we can now tackle the problem raised before of whether the Begriff shift relation of identity of content is the same as standard identity. To begin with, let us reiterate a crucial point. In first order languages with their standard semantics, there cannot exist a function symbol corresponding to quotation marks. This was Kaplan's point above. As Quine has stressed, we can enclose every name within quotation marks, but the result loses any semantic or logical connection with the original name, which figures in the quotation merely in the way a syllable figures in a given word. Here we read uh, Quine's passage because he's quite explicit on this. Quine writes, from the standpoint of logical analysis uh, in a standard semantic framework, each whole quotation must be regarded as a single word or sign whose parts count for no more than serifs or syllables. 
the personal name buried within the first word of the statement, Cicero has six letters, put in quotation marks, is logically no more germane to the statement than is the verb let, which is buried within the last word. It is not so in two component semantics, of course. When a semantic value is assigned to an expression such as Hesperus in bold, the correct semantic value is ipso facto given also to its quotation, quote Hesperus in bold. This means that Hesperus in bold figures in the quotation not as mere syllables or serif, but precisely as the numeral nine figures in the expression square root of nine. It's a normal argument of a function symbol. This is all important when it comes to answering the question we raised before. Is a standard identity the same as what Frege calls identity of content in paragraph eight of the shift? We now consider two different ways of answering this question. The first from the point of view of the standard interpretation of that passage, and the second from the point of view of our two component semantics. According to the standard interpretation of the gray shift, one is paraphrased as two, where one, Hesperus is identical in content to Phosphorus, is a sentence of the gray shift, and two is a sentence formed with a two place predicate, has the same content as, and two quotations taken as Quine describes them, hence as not involving a function symbol. We are saying this within a standard semantic framework, of course. So for the standard interpretation, the question then becomes, is two equivalent to three? Hesperus is identical to Phosphorus, where the predicate is standard identity? The answer is uh, obviously no. Here is why. For two to be true, it must be the case that the reference of the two quotations in it corifer. However, if, as Quine points out, the name Hesperus and the quotation quoting this name are logically not germane to one another, and so are the name Phosphorus and the quotation quoting this name, then there is some interpretation in which the names in three have the same referent, say, the planet Venus, but the quotations in two respectively refer to, for example, Mont Blanc and Gottlob Frege. On this interpretation, two is false and three is true. This means that two is not equivalent to three. And consequently, identity of content is not the same relation as standard identity, according to the standard interpretation with a standard semantics for quotation. Now consider two component semantics and our theory of quotation. The case envisaged above, where the names Hesperus and Phosphorus are given the same planet as referent, but the quotations quoting those names are given reference other than those two names is no longer an open possibility. We make this, this point a bit more formally in L+. Consider Hesperus in bold and quote Hesperus in bold. Now these two expressions are logically germane to one another. The semantic value of the latter functionally depends on the semantic value of the former. Similarly for phosphorus in bold and quote phosphorus in bold. Now there are only two cases Either Hesperus in bold and Phosphorus in bold have the same ordinary referent, or they do not, depending on the relevant interpretation we are considering. In either case, the following identities hold. Semantic value of quote Hesperus in bold is the ordered pair Hesperus in bold, quote Hesperus in bold. Semantic value of quote Phosphorus in bold is the ordered pair Phosphorus in bold, quote Phosphorus in bold. Regardless of the ordinary reference of Hesperus and Phosphorus in bold, these two identities hold in our semantics. Now consider two star, which is the L plus counterpart of two. Sorry, it reads a bit weird, but you should get the idea. Has the same ordinary referent as quote Hesperus, quote Phosphorus. We can also say quote Hesperus has the same ordinary referent as quote Phosphorus in bold. Consider the case in which Hesperus in bold and Phosphorus in bold have the same ordinary referent. This means that two star is true. Then also three star, which is the L plus counterpart of three is true. Hesperus is identical to Phosphorus. 
if on the other hand asperos and phosphorus in bold do not have the same ordinary referent both two star and three star will be false this shows that in our semantics two star and three star are equivalent so we can take Frege's claim that a is identical in content to b mean that the sign a and the sign b have the same conceptual content so that we can everywhere put b for a and conversely to characterize standard identity so in our semantics identity of content standard identity are equivalent this this is the point now all that we've been arguing for including this conclusion shows that church's misgivings about identity of content are unjustified and the crucial point here is that all occurrences of each singular term in Leibniz's law have the same semantic value for us. Moreover, Leibniz's law holds unrestrictedly in L, regardless of whether the predicate in the antecedent is taken as standard identity or as identity of content. Leibniz's law holds unrestrictedly in L plus only if the predicate in the antecedent is a strict identity, as we already said. One final all important point about this story about the interpretation of identity. As far as we know, all the interpretations of Frege's Burgess shift assume that identity of content is somehow a special predicate. Special here means that only this predicate is metalinguistic, as it were. We can now show that given our semantics, every predicate is equivalent to a metalinguistic predicate, namely one that takes quotation or quotations as argument or arguments. An intuitive argument, sorry for the uh, repetition, for this view is given by none other than Quine, and it can be found in the following passage. Um, Quine says, it would not be quite accurate to conclude that an occurrence of a name within single quotes is never referential. Consider the statements, A, Giorgione played chess is true, and B, Giorgione named the chess player each of which is true or false, according as the quotation-less statement C is true or false, where C is Giorgione played chess. No quotations. Our criterion of referential occurrence, namely substitutivity salva veritate of co-referential expressions, makes the occurrence of the name Giorgione in C referential and must make the occurrences of Giorgione in A and B referential by the same token, despite the presence of single quotes in A and B. The point about quotation is not that it must destroy referential occurrence, but that it can, and ordinarily does, destroy referential occurrence. The examples A and B are exceptional in that the special predicates is true and named have the effect of undoing the single quotes. So here, in a nutshell, Quine is saying uh, you can rephrase C in terms of A and B. So you can rephrase a sentence containing uh, an apparently non-metalinguistic predicate into a sentence containing a metalinguistic predicate, a predicate that takes quotations as arguments. Now, it goes without saying, uh, this is quite interesting, that Quine's argument, that it, sorry, that for Quine's argument to work, it must be the case that the very same name, Giorgione, occurs in all the sentences mentioned by Quine, A, B, and C. Notice that this is not the case in Quine's own official doctrine of quotation, according to which a quotation is a syntactically and semantically unstructured proper name of an expression, but it holds true in two component semantics. This is quite interesting. So if Quine is right about quotation marks, in A and B, there is no name Giorgione, actually. Giorgione is just a collection of syllables within the proper name Giorgione play, ch play chess or quotation of Giorgione in the second case. So it's interesting that he gives this argument as if it was forgetting about his own doctrine of quotation. On our doctrine of quotation, the name Giorgione genuinely occurs in A, B, and of course C. So the argument is better phrased in terms of two component semantics rather than standard semantics. Okay, I hope this is clear. Now we go through the more or less final part of the talk. Uh, we want to show an interesting application of two component semantics that has little or nothing to do actually with Frege's uh, worries about identity. This semantics allows us to advance an, an original and uh, simple view about Giorgione sentences, such as for Giorgione was so-called because of his size. 
there is a, a notorious pa puzzle concerning uh, the reading of four on which the adverb so harks back to the very name used in subject position. And here is the puzzle. Even though Giorgione was Barbarelli, replacing Giorgione with the name Barbarelli in four yields a falsehood and a prima facie counterexample to Leibniz's law. Giorgione had the property of being so called because of his size, but Barbarelli did not have the property of being called being so called because of his size. Um, uh, that's because, okay, the, uh, the final part of the word Giorgione, one evokes something big in Italian. That's uh, the point of the example. Uh, and you don't have this with the name Barbarelli, of course. Now, our solution to the puzzle is twofold. First, the adverb so harks back to the name displayed in the semantic value of the name Giorgione, which is therefore available for an anaphora of sorts. It's there in the semantic value, so you can use it for a sort of anaphora. Second, even though, uh, even though the sentence of L plus Giorgione is identical to Barbarelli is true, the sentence Giorgione hash Barbarelli, strict identity, is not, uh, simply because the names Giorgione and Barbarelli do not have the same semantic value. We already mentioned that Leibniz law holds for standard identity uh, unrestrictedly in L, but it does not in L+. Plus. It should be clear at this point how the predicate in four, being so called, uh, can straightforwardly be rendered by a unary predicate symbol of L+. Plus. Our approach to four suggests a way to informally paraphrase quotations that vividly captures the spirit of our theory of quotation. Consider the quotation Giorgione, not the name, the quotation, so quotation marks included. In light of our discussion of the Giorgione sentence four, we argue that this quotation is to be read roughly as the name of Giorgione so-called, where so harks back to the second component of the semantic value of the name Giorgione. This paraphrase should make it clear that the name Giorgione is a genuine syntactic constituent of the quotation. Note that even though Giorgione can have many names, for example, Paparelli, only one of them is displayed in the definite description paraphrasing the quotation. And this guarantees that the description is proper. To conclude this section on Giorgione sentences, uh, we want to pause a moment on the difference between Quine's approach to the Giorgione sentence four and our approach. Quine says that it is easy to translate four into five. Giorgione was called Giorgione because of his size, where the second Giorgione is quoted, of course. For Quine, four and five are thus synonymous by fiat. Not that there is no other way for him to cash out the import of so in first order language with its standard semantics. However, we think that there are independent reasons to maintain that four and five substantially differ. In five, but obviously not in four, the subject can be replaced salva veritate by the co-referential name Barbarelli, thus obtaining six. Barbarelli was called Giorgione because of his size. That's totally fine, that's true. However, six cannot be obtained via replacement from four directly, that is without going through five. And according to us, this suggests that four and five widely differ, contrary to what Quine says. Our approach also accounts for the difference at stake in the following way. Four contains a genuinely unary predicate, X is so called, which corresponds to a predicate of L plus, and five contains a binary predicate, X is called Y, which corresponds to a predicate of L and a fortiori of L plus. The terms replacing the variables in the latter predicate can vary independently of one another, of course, which obviously is not the case with the variable in the unary predicate. So they are two different predicates. Okay, so that's our take on Quine's mistake about uh, Giorgione sentences. And now really to the final part of the talk. In this final part, we consider variables and quantifiers this is because we want to tackle Dunwitz's worry as to the values to be assigned to variables. 
in the handout, you can read again Damit's passage. Damit wants to know what we assign to variables. That's what Frege should assign to variables, uh, uh, given his uh, metalinguistic understanding of identity of content, uh, the bifurcation of meaning, and all that story. So far, only the atomic closed fragments of L and N plus have been considered. Individual variables and quantifiers will now be added in the usual way. The adjective individual, individual variables, is to be stressed. In our languages, we only have quantifiers binding individual variables. It could not be otherwise because Alfred Tarski, in his classical work, The Concept of Truth in Formalized Languages, shows that if we had quantifiers binding sentential variables, then by treating quotation marks as a function symbol, we will become involved in various semantical antinomies, such as the antinomy of the liar. And of course, we don't like the antinomy of the liar. That's why in our languages, we only have quantifiers binding individual variables. That's crucial. Now, since the semantic values of individual constants are ordered pairs, ordered pairs are to be assigned to variables too. That's quite easy. But which ordered pairs exactly? Now, as regards standard semantics for first order quantified languages, it can be informally said that a variable under an assignment behaves as a temporary name of the object assigned in the assignment. In our case, the relatively obvious move is to let any assignment alpha assigned to a variable x in bold for some x belonging to the universe U, an individual, the ordered pair containing that individual x and x in bold, the variable itself. Clearly, under alpha, x in bold behaves as a temporary name of x. Temporary means for as long as alpha is under consideration. This should answer Damet's worry. Damet is worried about what we assign to variables, and here is our answer. We assign ordered pairs of this kind. Let us now consider quote x in bold. So here we have the variable x as an argument of our function symbol quote in bold in L+. Like any other function symbol applied to a variable, such as 3 plus x, it is in need of an assignment of a value to x in order to be interpreted, of course. Note, however, that for every assignment alpha, the semantic value of quote x relative to alpha is x in bold, quote x in bold. This is so because, recalling what we said a few minutes ago about the quotation, quoting the name Giorgione, quote x in bold relative to alpha is to be read roughly as the name of the individual assigned to x in bold by alpha, so-called, where so harks back to the temporary name of that individual, namely x in bold, the variable itself. So this is how we understand quote x in bold. We're interested in talking about quote x in bold because when it comes to the quantifiers, the interaction between quotation marks and variables has worried many people. In particular, Quine again. Quine writes, applied to the occurrence of the personal name in Cicero contains six letters, Cicero in quotation marks, existential generalization would lead us to D. There is an X such that X between quotation marks contains six letters. Now the expression X contains six letters means simply the 24th letter of the alphabet contains six letters. In D, the occurrence of the letter within the context of quotes is as irrelevant to the quantifier that precedes it as is the occurrence of the same letter in the context six. D consists merely of a falsehood, X contains six letters, preceded by an irrelevant quantifier, a vacuous quantifier. Now, there are three points to be noted in this passage. First, Quine is assuming that quotations are semantically unstructured proper names, hence not functional terms, as his comparison with the occurrence of X in six makes abundantly clear. These should not surprise us, this is Quine's official doctrine of quotation, as we have repeatedly said in the talk. Now, this fact implies, and this is the second point, that sentence D 
is made up of a vacuous existential quantifier preceding a false sentence. Third, Quine says that the subject of this false sentence, the quotation, refers to the 24th letter of the alphabet. Note that Quine's banishment of quantification into quotation marks has become a dogma in philosophical circles. It should be clear by now how we intend to respond. Since we construe quotation marks as a genuine function symbol, the occurrence of X within them is no different than its occurrence in, for example, 3 plus X, another functional term. The existential quantifier is therefore not vacuous on our approach. But of course, Quan is right about his third point. Quoting the variable tantamounts to naming the 24th letter of the alphabet. This is not to say, however, that X is prevented from working as a bindable variable. That is, according to us, it is still available for being assigned as something by an assignment. And in fact, as argued before, the semantic value of quote X in bold is the ordered pair X in bold, quote X in bold, for every assignment of ordered pairs of the form XX to the variable X. It follows then that D is false for us, for the name of the individual X, now called X in bold, is precisely X in bold, which only contains one letter and not six letters, so D is false. This means that the rule of existential generalization clearly does not hold unrestrictedly in L+, plus, but it makes perfectly good sense to quantify into quotation marks. So here the point is, you can quantify into quotation marks, it makes sense, the existential quantifier is not vacuous, is doing its usual job of the existential quantifier, but the result will be false. So the rule of the introduction of the existential quantifier does not hold unrestrictedly in L+, plus, but it makes sense to quantify. In future work, we will give a full-fledged treatment of the quantifiers and the validity of the rules involving them in L+. Plus. We will also explore which expressions of natural language besides quotation marks and X is so-called can be rendered in L+. Plus. In particular, since quotation is usually taken to be the paramount example of an opaque context, our hunch is that two-component semantics will prove useful to address the puzzles of propositional attitude reports. And we think that the perceptive reader already has some of the main ingredients to figure out how we will proceed in this respect. And I think we can stop here. Okay, Andrea, Marco, thank you so much. We have some time for for a Q&A session, so any questions or comments, please. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you very much for... Do you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Thank you very much for your most illuminating presentation. Uh, I ha have a minor question, I think. Uh, if you go back to the top of the page 7, uh, where you um, uh, try to show difference uh, between uh, sorry, two, page seven. X is so cold and X is cold. Wait. I just before the variables and quantifiers. Yeah, yeah, here. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe I misunderstood you, but do you mean to say that X is so cold is uh, to be construed as sort of unstructured predicate uh, so that is different from X is cold? Because my uh, so my concern is uh, with compositionality, uh, because uh, it obviously have some elements that uh, always has some elements in common with X is cold. So uh, did I just misconstrue you? Do you not mean that X is so cold is like unstructured uh, different predicate? Uh, so your uh, first, before answering, I want to be sure about the question. The question is, here we have two different predicates, X is so called and X is called Y. And your question is, do you really need 
to say that X is so-called is an unstructured predicate, as in it, uh, it's a unary predicate, basically? That's your question? Yes. Yes. My answer is, uh, our answer is, yes, we need that uh, to account for the difference between four and five. So, uh, four contains this unary predicate, five contains a binary predicate, and this is the crucial difference, is so-called, is sensitive to the second component of the semantic value, whereas is called is not sensitive to that component. Uh, so take this example. Giorgione is called Barbarelli. Here you put Barbarelli between quotation marks, right? Giorgione is called Barbarelli. Maybe you don't put quotation marks in, uh, in ordinary written language, but you should put quotation marks. Giorgione is called Barbarelli. Now here you are employing the second predicate, is called. And in fact, that's sensitive to the first component of the semantic value of the quotation Barbarelli, namely the name Barbarelli. Uh, and that's why it's a predicate of L and not of L plus. It's sensitive to the first component. Is so-called, on the other hand, is sensitive to the second component. It looks at the second component of the, the semantic value of X. Giorgione is so-called on the relevant interpretation, of course, on the anaphoric uh, uh, interpretation. So that's why we need the difference between is so-called and uh, is called Y. Did I answer your question? Can I add that? Yes. Uh, my uh, worry uh, was, uh, wouldn't that, um, well, wouldn't that entail some problems with the principle of compositionality? Because uh, what uh, it entails, it seems to me that uh, the predicate is called, has nothing to do whatsoever with the predicate is so-called. Uh, so they are two completely different uh, mm -hmm. things not having to do anything with each other. Completely different. That you're right. Uh, Giorgione was called Giorgione in quotes uh, because of his size. Is the only sentence available to Quine in standard semantics to render Giorgione was so called because of his size. Uh, the our unary predicate is not available in ordinary first of the language. It is available uh, in. Uh, our extended semantics, and of course, it has little relation with uh, the binary predicate used by Quine. Mm -hmm. They are entirely different predicates. Now, what, and in fact, um, intuitively, there shouldn't be any connection between the two, because X is called Y, and X is so-called, uh, are not in intuitively related, it seems to me. <laughs> All right, thank you. But they're slightly related. Yeah, they're related in a way. But the difference is why anyway. Yeah, I, I agree. Of course, I get, I get your point uh, that there seems to be some kind of relation because they both contain cold. But uh, for the purposes of, uh, for semantic purposes, uh, they should be treated as different predicates according to us. Uh, precisely because they are sensitive to different components of the semantic values of their arguments. Oh, yeah, I get your point. No, wait a minute, wait a minute. I might add that there is a way in which you can reach the binary predicate, X is called Y, uh, starting from the unary predicate, X is so-called, uh, with a little, um, by adding a few, uh, a few meaning postulates, to use uh, Carnap's expression. You could do that, yes bringing out the relationship between the unary and the binary predicate. You're right. That we, we should um, uh, bring out the, the, the relation between the two. And what do you think the relation should be? Are the, these predicates reducible to each other, or maybe they are explicable in terms of each other? Or, or uh, they, uh, I, in the X is so-called, uh, should, uh, um, 
um, wait a minute, you should, uh, uh, you should add, uh, um, it's not immediately clear to me, I should think about it for, for a while, but you see, uh, the thing is that if you say Giorgione was so called, um, you're using the name Giorgione and uh, mentioning it at the same time. So, in a way, you're putting some, you're you're using the the uh, the, the pragmatics of the um, of the, the 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 pragmatics of the utterance and uh, uh, injecting it in our in our semantics into the the the, the semantics of the sentence so uh, it's not so easy to spell out the relationship between the unary and the binary predicate um, it, it takes um, uh, a while to do that but the relation it, it brings out the relationship between semantics and pragmatics. So it's a complicated issue. I'm sorry, I was not very clear before. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my question uh, is slightly beyond uh, your uh, beyond the uh, questions you discussed. Uh, do you expand your semantics to the expressions uh, with logical connectives? And if yes, what kind of content uh, does your semantics subscribe to uh, expressions uh, with logical connectives within uh, their quoted clause? If uh, if this clause, uh, uh, if if this con content uh, compositional uh, with respect to uh, these connectives or not. I mean that if we consider two expressions uh, with, uh, which have the same denotation and uh, differ only in presence of logical connectives, for example, uh, the first phosphorus is a planet uh, is true and <clears throat> phosphor phosphorus is a planet quoted is true and the second uh, phosphorus is not a planet. Uh, quoted uh, is not true. Uh, what your semantics uh, will say about strict identity of these expressions? Uh, so, let me start with this and then you tell me if uh, you want to hear more. Uh, the connectives. Uh, negation, conjunction, etc. They are not uh, here officially in the in L and L plus because they, we only consider the, the atomic uh, fragment, uh, but we suspect that adding them will not cause any trouble because the semantic value of, uh, for example, negation, of the symbol for negation, will be an ordered pair containing negation, whatever you think it is, a function uh, uh, on truth values, and the second component of which is uh, the symbol itself. So, uh, if the question is uh, how we manage to add the connectives to L or L plus, uh, the answer is, uh, well, as you usually do in uh, a standard semantics, except that the second component uh, will be an idle burden that you use to uh, form non-atomic sentences containing the connectives. Uh, so, we don't see why the connective should pose any problem to L or L+. Plus. Uh, similarly, if the connectives appear between quotation marks. So, uh, just like you can quote Hesperus, so you can put Hesperus, the name Hesperus between quotation marks. Quotation marks are for us a function symbol operating on the semantic value of the name Hesperus. You can put between quotation marks a sentence Hesperus is uh, nice, uh, or the negation of the sentence, Hesperus is not nice. And again, you will have a quotation marks as a function symbol operating on the semantic value of the expression, in this case, the sentence or the negated sentence. 
And the result will be straightforward because the function, uh, the projection function, the referent of the quotation marks, will take the second component of the semantic value, namely the sentence itself, the negated sentence itself, and move it to the, to the first position as with the sentences which don't contain connectives or with any other. Exception. So did I answer your question? Yes, thanks. Good. So, any more questions? Yes, yes. Uh, my question is, would uh, um, your theory of uh, meaning of identity statements, identity statements in your language entail um, the might entail the change of modality of identity statements, uh, that maybe identity statements are not or well, necessarily necessary, uh, that, that uh, there might be contingent identities. It, it is a relation between names, as Frege says in the, um, in the passage in the Greek script that you quote. Um, then there seem to be more, more room for uh, things like contingent identities, or is that merely an illusion? We don't know. Uh, we haven't thought about that complicated issue, uh, namely the issue of modality and so on. Uh, we suspect that the reason why Frege gave up his Begriffschit version uh, had something to do with modality. And in fact, in Ubezin und Bedeutung, he doesn't mention anything like Church's or Dummett's criticism to the Begriff shift. He only mentions the, uh, the, um, the fact that the relationship between a name and uh, an object is what is arbitrary. Yeah. Um, I, it's not immediately clear to us what our arbitrarity uh, consists in, in Frege's uh, mind, but we suspect that it has something to do with necessity or contingency. And therefore, our next step will be to consider modality. We don't know what happens. Thank you very much. have a kind of comment, but well, mm -hmm. it is rather ill-stated, at least for now. Uh, the comment is as follows. Uh, let's get to those uh, expression, uh, examples again. Giorgione was so-called <laughs> code precise. I guess uh, in a natural language, to be, to be so-called can be understood in at least in two ways. Mm -hmm. Like uh, it can be understood <laughs> with a narrow scope and with a wide scope, if you like. For example, Giorgione was so called because of his size. He we may interpret it as Giorgione was called Giorgione because of his size. And this is uh, what I call a narrow scope. And the white and an example of white scope is as follows. So we, we need some more context. Like Georgiana was called the big one because of his size, and Georgiana was so called because of his size. Uh, so when we have 
both these sentences uh, together, we may understand the, this predicate to be called to be so called uh, as a kind of uh, complex anaphora referring to the the big one expression from the first sentence. What do you think about it? Uh, sorry, the the what what you call the wide scope reading. I didn't get precisely uh, what you mean. Un, un indicale, un With the, the, the okay, yeah. okay, where you need uh, to point something, as in Giorgione was so called, and I point to the name Giorgione. Uh, this is what oh. you had in mind. No, 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 no. no. That, what I then what is the white scope? Is, mm. yeah. is the following example. Giorgione was called the big one because of his size. Someone says, someone said this. And from, and for example, the same person or some another person says, Giorgione was so called because of his size. So the second person refers to the big one as an argument for the to be so-called predicate. Yes, but it seems to me that in your example, you still have a demonstrative uh, demonstrating not the name Giorgione, but something else. But it is, yes, uh, yes. it is as if, I mean, you, you could, uh, um, you could use the, the demonstrative that pointing at different things. And uh, uh, of course, uh, in that case, you don't have uh, our unary predicate. Uh, you should have something else. I agree, but um, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, this is not, it, it seems to me, it is not a criticism to our interpretation of uh, Quine's sentence. Uh, there's a different interpretation, I agree, um, which ought to be rendered, I don't know, somehow differently. Um, I mean, so is not harking back to the name used. Um, it's harking back to something else. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's uh, the debate on uh, Giorgione sentences. Uh, it's uh, commonly accepted that uh, sentence four has different readings, right? So it has a reading where so is a demonstrative. And I think that your example uh, falls under the falls under the reading. Um, okay. So this is not the relevant interpretation of the sentence for Quine's purposes when he discusses George on the sentences. The relevant interpretation is that in which so somehow works as a sort of anaphora. Uh, which is not no, Marco. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, the first interpretation you mentioned, Giorgione was called Giorgione because of his size, is the interpretation Quine has in mind. But according to us, to us that paraphrase is not adequate uh, because of what we explained. So you have two interpretations, so working as a sort of anaphora, and so working as a demonstrative. The interpretation where it works as a demonstrative is not really relevant for our purposes. It's not what uh, causes troubles uh, according to Quine. What causes troubles is the anaphor, sort of anaphoric reading of so, which Quine renders as Giorgione was called Giorgione because of his size, and which we don't render in that way. We render it uh, in the way we uh, uh, illustrated, so Hart refers back to the name displayed in the semantic value of Giorgione. Uh, I hope uh, I answered the, the worry. Yes, thank you. So any more questions? Looks like there are no more questions. So okay. thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.